Suicide bombers, first of all, are not low in education. They're not necessarily poor economically. They are not insane. This is Faith Complex, a dialogue about the entanglement of religion, politics and art. Hello, my name is Jacques Berlinerblau of Georgetown University and you're watching Faith Complex. Joining us today is Professor Fatali Mogadam. He is a Georgetown professor of psychology and author of the upcoming book, The New Global Insecurity, How Terrorism, Environmental Collapse, Economic Inequalities and Resource Shortages Are Changing Our World. Uh, professor Mogadam, welcome to Faith Complex. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. Now, you've written quite a bit about the minds of Islamic terrorists. So I guess the first question I want to ask you is what makes them tick, tick, tick? The minds of the Islamic terrorists are very much like the minds of all human beings who are put into what I call the first level of the staircase to terrorism and then find themselves moving up this staircase. So in explaining terrorism, I emphasize the context and the conditions in the Islamic world and what I've described as a collective identity crisis of Islam and the consequent impact on individuals. So we have to look at the mind of the terrorist in the context of that staircase and of course in the context of globalization. Let's get to the actual psyche or mind of our garden variety or ideal type suicide bomber. What do we know? What does the research show us? Who are these people? If you look at the statistics, the, most, the majority are male. And the majority are between the ages of something like 16 and 26, something like that. Very young. We know that males are risk takers. There's also the issue of how to put your stamp on your life, how to show yourself as significant. And of course, if you look at the rhetoric of the recruiters, and in one of my books, From the Terrorist Point of View, I've identified nine specialties within terrorist organizations. The terrorist suicide bomber is just one of these specialties. I call them fodder. Mm. They're usually fodder because they're expendable. They're given very little information. Typically, they have to be young men who want to be special. Mm. The rhetoric of the recruiters is all about how you are special and can become even more special. So it's that need for significance and the emptiness that the context gives them. That's the special combination. Was Muhammad Atta a garden variety example of the suicide bomber or did he bring something special to the table? Well, I think the 9-11 attacks and a number of uh, attacks we've seen have, uh, pinpoint this issue very well, that suicide bombers, first of all, are not low in education. They're not necessarily poor economically. Right. Mm -hmm. um, they are not insane. This might sound like a flip question, but why are they so often engineers? I, I can't think of a profession that's ah. so closely marked to another <laughs> profession. Suicide bomber equals yes. engineer. Why is that? Well, th that comes back to the characteristics of the Middle East. Mm. If you go to the Middle East, what you find is the most politically active students are not the social scientists, they're the engineers and the technicians. Mm. But in the Middle East, the culture is such that if somebody says, I'm going to study political science, they say, well, you've got brains, why would you do that? Mm. Go and become an engineer. Because engineers, doctors, those are the two mm. groups that make money in those societies. And to the best of my knowledge, we've never had an art history major who's a suicide bomber or somebody who studies musicology. <laughs> it's very odd that they're, that they're always yes. engineers or, or physicians. So this idea of the frustrated aspirations I find extremely interesting because mm -hmm. you can 
reconcile it on two levels. You can speak of the global frustration of a religion that takes itself to be the seal of the religions or the final revelation, yes. not experiencing the, the sense of triumph or supremacy mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. it might have five, six hundred years ago. Yes. But then there are also the personal psychological frustrations of someone that doesn't quite get the job they thought they were supposed to get or have the income they yes. thought they were supposed yes. to achieve. Absolutely. But we should also come back to this issue of globalization and very broad trends. At the moment, a person could be sitting in a remote village in a third world country, impoverished materially relative to our standards, but receiving most of the messages we receive about consumer products. We're at one level raising aspirations, raising expectations, and increasing relative deprivation at the same time, we are sending out messages telling everybody, you have a right to democracy, you have a right to freedom, etc., etc. Right. If you were asked by the State Department or the FBI to engage in some profiling, do you think the tools are refined enough right now to start profiling uh, a young Muslim lad that might grow up and become uh, a suicide bomber one day? I don't believe that profiling is the correct way to go. Mm. Um, there are some excellent profilers. In the area of terrorism, it seems to me, if you think about the staircase, we need two types of programs. One is short-term programs for the people, individuals who've reached the top floors of the staircase. They're adamant they're going to blow up somebody and themselves. They're going to kill. And the only thing to do with them is to take them out, hmm. either capture them or kill them. Let me say something else related to this. We have to build up collective resilience so that when there is an attack, people, millions of us, don't suddenly throw up our hands and say the government has failed. Because hmm. the government has not failed. There's bound to be somebody slipping through, whether it's here or in the other country. So we have to build up collective resilience against suicide attacks. But surely the recent underwear bomber um, should have been spotted in a crowd. No, the cues were there. Uh, well, you can certainly argue in retrospect that you know, the cues were there. But at the same time, I would argue that when you have such enormous borders, when you have thousands of planes, when you have thousands of ships, something is going to slip through. Apart from that short-term tactic of getting people at the top of the staircase, there has to be the long-term tactic of changing the conditions on the ground floor so that individuals are not motivated to go up the staircase. And that requires long-term programs and a change of tactic by not the Democratic Party, not the Republican Party, but by the U.S. government generally, to say, look, we can get oil without having to support dictatorships. Let me link this even to something else that's broader. Imagine what the Middle East would look like if Israel was surrounded by democracies. I don't believe there would be a war mm. at all. I think the present problem arises out of dictatorships. And as long as we have the dictatorships we have, we're always going to be talking about the Middle East war or the Middle East conflict. Sure. It's endless. Indeed. We've been speaking to Professor Fatale Mogadam, uh, an expert on suicide bombing. And we thank you so much for coming to Faith Complex today, Professor. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure.